Welcome to lecture 3.1, second order linear differential equations. So you should know by now what a second order differential equation is. It's, it's an equation of a function involving its derivatives, and the highest derivative that appears is the second order. But uh, given that, we're only going to be considering second order equations of the following form, ones where you can actually isolate y double prime and solve for it as a function of t, y, and y prime. Now of course you could write an equation where you can't isolate and solve for y double prime, but those really don't come up in practice. So for all intents and purposes it's perfectly fine to consider these type of equations as second order differential equations. Of course a solution is any function y of t such that when you plug it back into this equation, the left-hand side, the second derivative of y is equal to the right-hand side, which is this function of the other derivatives, well, t, y, and y prime. So as a motivating example, let's revisit Newton's second law of motion. Force is mass times acceleration. Now, force could be gravitational, mechanical, or something else. And it can be a function of time, displacement, and velocity. In other words, force, which is some function of t x and x prime by Newton's second law, is m x double prime. And if we solve for x double prime by dividing through by m, we can write Newton's second law as a second order differential equation, like up here. And in the remainder of this lecture, we will focus on a few examples of this starting with when the force is just gravity and getting more complicated by considering mass spring systems. Okay, so let's start with the simplest example. We just have a gravitational force. In this case, we have a mass that is subject to only gravity. So by Newton's second law, F is m times acceleration, which is m times x double prime. And here the only force is gravity, which is negative m times g. So here is our second order differential equation. So the second example is when we have a, a non-constant force, and let's say a spring force. Let's make things easier and assume that there's no gravity. So we can do that by saying that the mass is like on a table, and it's going back and forth, something like this. Now recall from high school physics, Hooke's law, this is for springs, this says that the restoring force, that's the pushback from the spring, is equal to, well, it's, it's proportional to the displacement and in the opposite direction. So we say it's negative k for some constant times x. So this is similar to the terminal velocity, or the air resistance thing, whereas if, except this is of course is a function of x instead of v. So one way to think about this is if you push the spring inward this direction, then the force exerted is in the opposite direction. And if you stretch the spring out, then the force, restoring force is inward. And the proportional thing means roughly that if you compress the string twice as much, the force is twice as large, and vice versa. Okay, so with this um, spring force, we, we have that F is M times X double prime, which is equal to our restoring force, which is negative K times X. So here's a Here's a real diff second order differential equation that we, we don't know how to solve because there's an x double prime and an x. This one is eh, technically second order, but we can just integrate it twice to solve. So over the third example, let's put these together, spring force plus gravity. So here we have like a, maybe a, a hanging spring. I mean, a hanging mass and spring. So forces add. So um, let, let's write this as F is, is the restoring force plus the gravitational force. Oh, that should be, let's erase that and redo that. Gravitational 
force. And so that means that F equals M times X double prime equals negative KX plus MG. So here's our second order equation. And let me point out that up here we actually used said negative MG, right? Because as we did in previous lectures, we're measuring distance from the ground. So this is the ground, we're measuring the positive distances in the positive direction. We could do that down here, but here I'm going to take the opposite convention. Doesn't really matter, but I'm going to say that the positive direction is downward. So if we pull the spring downward, then we're moving in the positive direction. In other words, zero is going to be right here at equilibrium. So it does, in, in the end, it doesn't matter as long as we're consistent, but I just wanted to point out that this is a popular convention is to write this as, as positive. Okay, so the final example I want to do is when we have we have this example, but we also have a damping force. Sp springs don't bounce forever. If we were to pull this mass down and release it, it would oscillate, oscillate, and it would slowly die out because some of the energy would dissipate. So this is like air resistance, the damping force. So let me, uh, uh, let me, how do I want to say it? Let me say this here. This is like, like air resistance. In that it is, it is proportional to velocity. Proportional. velocity, which is v or x prime, if we just use x, and it is in the, it acts against the direction of motion. So acts against the direction of motion. So I said that the, the restoring force is, is like air resistance. This is even more so because it's not a function of x, it's a function of x prime. So, oh, and last thing, it's, again, it's proportional to the velocity. If we have, if, if the spring is bouncing twice as fast, we're going to assume that there's twice as much of a damping or a resisting force. So a way to model this is, let's say that the damping force is a function of velocity, and it's, we say it's proportional to velocity in the opposite direction, meaning that it's, negative mu times x prime, where mu is a constant. So forces add. So in this case, we have F is equal to the, the damping force. So the force on the object is equal to the damping force plus the restoring force plus the gravitational force, m times g, and this means that m times, let's plug everything in, x double prime equals negative mu times x prime minus kx plus mg. So here is our second order differential equation. If we want to, we can divide through by m. And later in this section, we're going to analyze this in a few lectures from now analyze this in more detail. For now, we'll just give an overview as to the two general approaches for solving and analyzing second order ODEs. So the first one is akin to what we've been doing so far with first order ODEs, is we just solve them directly. And then the second method takes a second order ODE and converts it into a system of two first order equations. And then from there we will use tools um, from linear algebra and matrix analysis to analyze and solve these systems. And this may seem a little bit strange or unfounded at first, but let me give you a simple example, which I hope will convince you as to why this is actually very natural. So let me write down a second order differential equation. So just something simple. 
like what we saw on the previous slide. This might be a mass spring system with an external force, that's sinusoidal, say. And this is second order because it involves acceleration, the second derivative of x. And of course we know that instead of thinking of this as the second derivative of x, we can think of it as the first derivative of velocity. So in other words, we can write this, we can introduce a new variable v to be x prime. And then we can, instead of writing a, a sec, second derivative here, we can write this as v prime. So for, let me re rewrite this like that. Let me rewrite this as um, v prime plus 2 v plus 3 x equals sine of t. And then let me write this as x prime equals v. And now I'm going to put all the derivatives onto one side of the equation. So I'm going to write this as v prime equals negative 2v plus, not plus, that should be, that should be minus, minus 3x plus sine of t, and x prime equals v. If you prefer, you can say plus 0x plus 0. Now you may have seen matrices before. If you haven't, that's fine. Um, but the, the idea with this is that we can rewrite this. So matrices, you can, matrices can describe systems of linear equations. So we can write this in so-called matrix form as the following. V prime, so we can write this system as a, I think I'll just do it for you, negative 2, negative 3, and if this is totally foreign, if you've never seen anything like this matrices, that's perfectly fine. So this is V, this is X, and then I'm going to add these terms that don't involve that. So this is sine t, and this is zero. So we have written this original second order equation as a system, and now I can write this, let me write this as a vector x prime equals some matrix A. This, let me call this a vector x, and let me call this a vector B. So once we write this in this form, now we have the tools from linear algebra and matrices available to us to analyze this. And again, if you've never seen matrices as system, represent systems of equations, this was probably totally foreign to you, and that's perfectly fine. We'll learn all about it in section four. Okay, so let me finish by finding what a linear and homogeneous second order ODE is. This is similar to the first order case. So a linear second order ODE can be written in the following form. So it's P of T, P and Q can be any, and F can be any functions of T. They can involve T squared or T cubed, but the point is that there's, it's linear in the derivative. So we don't have any E to the Y or sine of Y prime or Y times Y prime or anything like that. Now, if we have a linear ODE like this, and this, this term f of t is zero, then we say it is also homogeneous. One way to describe what it means for an equation to be homogeneous is that z zero, the zero function is a solution. And that's gonna be true throughout this class. If this is zero, then y be equal to zero is a solution. So a big idea of second order ODEs, and we will talk about this more in a later lecture, is that a linear second order ODE has a two parameter family of solutions that looks like this. So 
this, so y of t is c, c1 times the first solution plus c2 times the second solution plus yp of t, where this is any particular solution. So this is a lot like the one, um, not the one, the first order case. This thing, as we will see, so just a preview for now, this is going to be the homogeneous solution. In other words, to solve a second order differential equation like this, we're going to, the first thing to do, always, is to consider the related homogeneous equation, make this zero, solve that, and then somehow come up with any particular solution that works and then add them together. So the summary, summary for, for solving, it's a two-step process. It's like that method of undetermined coefficients that I gave you a preview of in the previous section, is to solve the homogeneous ODE. So that's y double prime plus p of t y plus q of t, sorry, that's y prime, equals 0. And that's going to have a two-parameter family of solutions. We're going to have two constants of integrations, not one, c1 and c2. And then next, we need to find any solution yp of t to the original equation. And then the last step is the general solution is our homogeneous solution plus our particular solution. So it's, it's very similar to that last method that I showed you for first order equations. And so in light of that, I think it's kind of silly that most books and classes don't even mention this as a feasible way to solve first order equations. They always focus on integrating factor and variation of parameters. But this method works too, and it really makes this method less, or not less, but as I should say, seem more natural when you see it for second order equations. And so we'll do this in a lot more detail in the later lectures in this chapter.